welcome back to the channel. What's up, bro? Anyways, listen, it's a little bit cold today. A little bit, just a little bit too cool for me. 29 degrees. Actually, it's about 40. Just kidding you with the hood. I know some of you are in 17 degrees. No, it's not Christmas time. I just like to uh, be cozy. I'm a cozy person. I like to be cozy. What can I tell you? What can I tell you? Uh, I think it's very sweet. It's cozy. You want to put a present underneath the tree for me? You do. It's up to you. You can donate below if you wish. Donate below. Donate below if you want to buy me a cup of coffee. Okay, you can buy Maria a jacket. All right. Great to see you here today. Let's take a look at this next video. Remember, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Keep on keeping on. Don't give up. Continue forward. Okay? Let's go forward. All right? Let's go out into the wild and experience our best life now. Join us oh. here at the Guitar Temple. I hope you enjoy the video and come back again, all right? Former guitarist for the iconic rock band Fleetwood Mac, Bob Welch, was found dead today at the age of 65 at his Nashville home. As country music celebrated at the CMT Music Awards in Nashville last night, we are humbled today by this loss. According to Nashville police, Bob Welch shot himself in the chest and was found by his wife at their home around 12.15 p.m. Thursday, June 7th. Bob had recently had some health issues and reportedly left a suicide note confirming the cause of death. Bob Welch not only was a guitarist but vocalist for Fleetwood Mac from 1971 to 74, but had a solo career and he formed the British rock group Paris in 1976 and had hits that included Sentimental Lady and Ebony Eyes. When you were young, you got down on your knees. You prayed for someone, someone you could believe. Yeah, you put your faith right in his hand. Oh, when he let go, you couldn't understand. Welcome down from your church. guitar player Jeremy Spencer left the band in 1971, and Danny Kerwin, another guitarist, left in 1972, after he had a backstage fistfight with guitarist Bob Welch. Bob was one of the first members of the band. Not long after the group was created, Mick Fleetwood invited Bob to be a guitarist on their records. Bob toured with the group in the early days and contributed to a lot of old music produced by Fleetwood Mac. After some time on tour, members of the band began dropping like flies. Danny Kerwin and Bob Welch got into a backstage fight in 1972, which resulted in serious injuries to both men, and the dismissal of Danny from the band. Though Bob was going through tough times, he persevered. He actually became more well-known as a musician after he left Fleetwood Mac. Four of Welch's original songs made it to the Top 100 Billboard chart. By the 80s, he had failed to become an established solo artist with a sound that attracted an audience. He also developed an addiction to heroin. Fortunately, after several years of hard work, Bob was able to overcome the addiction, and he moved to Nashville to continue his dream of being a songwriter. Sadly, in June of 2012, Bob Welch died at age 65. He committed suicide in his Nashville home where he lived with his wife. He left a note for his wife explaining why he would do such a thing. Bob underwent a spinal surgery several months before he took his life. Bob was not recovering at the rate his doctors would have hoped. Eventually, it became clear he would never fully recover, nor would he live a life free of pain. During his childhood, Bob watched his mother care for his sick father for years. Bob mentioned in his letter he was unwilling to do the same kind of thing to his wife, Wendy. After his death became public, fans and former bandmates poured their hearts out in grievance. Terry Allen Kath was born on January 31, 1946, in Chicago, Illinois. 
He's most notably known for having been one of the founding members of the band Chicago. According to one source, Terry also didn't read music. Kath's father wanted him to have a steady career, but Terry preferred a career in music. The band moved and signed with Columbia Records, changing their name to Chicago Transit Authority. They started performing on a regular basis at the Whiskey A Go Go in West Hollywood, which gave them more exposure and they became opening acts for bands such as Janis Joplin and Jimi Hendrix. Jimi Hendrix is quoted as having said about the band, Geez, your horn players are like one set of lungs and your guitar player is better than me. According to Peter Cetera, the band was booked to perform at Woodstock in 1969, but promoter Bill Graham rescheduled them to play at the Fillmore West on a date of his choosing, which was the Woodstock dates. Santana took Chicago's place at Woodstock, with this performance being considered his breakthrough gig. He wasn't addicted to anything, but he was abusing drugs. We were all doing drugs at that stage of the game. But if you're incredibly unhappy and depressed and doing drugs on top of that, it compounds the situation. The night before Terry died, he visited bandmate Laudir de Oliveira, who offered him tea, and the two spent all night talking. Producer James Guercio insists that Terry was finishing writing a solo album. By 1978, Terry was regularly carrying guns around and enjoyed target shooting. On January 23rd, after a party at the home of band tech Don Johnson, Terry began to play with his guns. He spun his 38 revolver on his finger, put it to his temple, and pulled it to the trigger. The gun at this point wasn't loaded. Initially, there was a sigh of relief. Johnson warned Terry several times to be careful. Kath then picked up a semi-automatic 9mm pistol, and while leaning back in a chair, he said to Johnson, Don't worry about it. Look, the clip is not even in it. Terry's last words were, What do you think I'm going to do? Blow my brains out? Terry then showed the empty mag. He replaced the mag in the gun and put it to his temple and pulled the trigger. Unknown to him, there was a round in the chamber, and the shot killed him instantly. It was eight days before his 32nd birthday. He left behind his 20-month-old daughter, Michelle, and girlfriend, Camilla Emily Ortiz. Terry is buried at Forest Lawn Memorial Park in Los Angeles, California. He was 31. has been confirmed that Ozzy Osbourne did in fact punch Randy Rhodes just days before he was tragically killed. Now, way back in 2004, uh, bassist Bob Daisley said this, that, that uh, Ozzy had punched Randy. And, and Bob wasn't touring with the band at the time, so he must have heard it secondhand from Rudy or Tommy or someone. But this past week, um, Tommy Aldridge did in fact confirm in an interview that Ozzy did punch Randy. Now, there's been a lot of back and forth between Bob Daisley and the Ozzy camp for years. Um, and there's a, unfortunately, a track record of Ozzy and Sharon. It, it's really Sharon that runs the show, treating Bob Daisley uh, and, and, 
pretty much anyone in the band like like crap, right? So it's just their history is replete with this type of, of stuff that they just treated people horribly. Jakey Lee was cheated out of, of uh, royalties. It was just all kinds of crazy stuff. But there had been so much back and forth between Bob Daisley and, and the, the Aussie bunch that I'm, I'm not saying that, that you couldn't believe Bob Daisley, but Bob wasn't actually there in the band touring when Randy died. So I think that was kind of discounted when he said that, that – uh, Ozzy had punched Randy, but Tommy Aldridge, who has always been kind of outside of all the fray, he's he's never been one to talk a lot about uh, bad stuff that went on. In fact, go find any interview with Tommy Aldridge. You'll be shocked at what a soft-spoken, kind, gentle man he is, right? A complete opposite of his image. You know, I think of Animal on the Muppet Show when I see Tommy Aldridge because he's just a wild man and an excellent drummer. But he's very soft-spoken and very um, uh, keeps to himself, right? So when Tommy confirmed that, yes, in fact, Ozzy did punch Randy, that was kind of, wow, uh, that was kind of a shocker, even though it hadn't been mentioned, you know, 16 years before to hear Tommy say it really um, uh, brought it home. Yes. He mentions the fact that he wasn't really into the whole heavy metal uh, thing, the trappings of heavy metal, the leather, the the devil stuff. And, and he talks about how at some of these shows, you'd have just freaky people show up with goats and all kinds of weird stuff and he just was not into that and he was really uh, even um, in the last few months was taking one-on-one um, -on -one, you know private classical guitar lessons and 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 working towards doing something outside of of the blizzard of Oz outside of Ozzy's band would there have been there there maybe would not have been an album with Randy after diary I'm not sure. It kind of looks that way that he was not happy. And um, of course, the public facade that Ozzy and Sharon had put out was that, you know, every, it was a big, happy family. Everyone loved each other. It was wonderful, blah, blah, blah. But I don't think that was the case. And according to Tommy, when Randy had, Randy told Ozzy that he wanted to leave the band and that Ozzy sucker punched Randy. So punched him. And Randy's. A, a little guy. I mean, he's like five foot five, you know, probably weighed 125 pounds, just a little guy. And Ozzy's kind of a big guy. Uh, so that's pretty crappy. Um, and sadly, um, you know, we'll, we'll never hear Randy's side of the story. Uh, but uh, sadly, just shortly after that was when uh, he was... And there's the video. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm going to talk to you a little bit later. And uh, come back and see me. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. Yes, you can. Buy me a cup of coffee down below. Donate if you want. Going to put some presents under that tree there. All right. Thanks for stopping by. I love you all. You're very kind. You're very sweet. And I do appreciate you. I really honestly do. Till next time.